A very good morning to you who is watching us uh, from wherever it is you are. Uh, excuse me as my panelists join us uh, in, in no particular order. Um, as their streams buffer and we are, we are live, I want to invite all of you to today's discussion on one of the 16 days of activism as we celebrate the International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. I'm joined with a very capable panel. More of them will be joining in. You know the nature of specialists these days. We are always in Zoom meetings. So some of them are joining in a bit later. On my panel today, I have Joyce Kimani, I have Dave and Jock, I have Mohammed Dagar, and I have Elizabeth Kabari, as well as Joyce, as well as uh, Alibi, uh, as well as Mugloki. Uh, Sophie Murioki. I also have Njeri Wamuigui, who will be joining us a bit later into the live feed. But I want to take this opportunity to take stock of the discussions that we have had from the beginning of the 16 days of activism. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Anika Initiative in partnership with a host of so many organizations brought you discussions on gender-based violence, discussions on the first day which was uh, advocating for against violence against women. And today we are bringing you yet another important and very pertinent discussion, the discussion on human trafficking and modern day slavery. I want to very quickly begin by uh, inviting Joyce Kimani to give, to give her opening remarks as the regional director of the one of the partners that are, are enabling us to give you this live stream, so Joyce. Please introduce yourself and uh, give us your opening remarks. Over to you, Joyce. Please unmute yourself. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Uh, I hope you're enjoying this day. My name is Joyce Kimani. I'm the uh, regional di director for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. The GTOC analyzes organized crime in the region. And response to organized crime. Our work sponsors. Economy. The country is identified as a source, transit, and destination of sex trafficking and forced labor. Uh, the global trafficking in person report Kenya in the second tier. This means that the this means that the country does not meet the minimum standards for the human trafficking and child protection unit. There's been an alarming and sudden spike in care. I'm sorry, Joyce, we, we keep losing you, Joyce. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I'm so sorry about been, that. You, uh, you were saying there has been an alarming rise. That's where we left. Oh, that's where you are. Wow. Sorry. There's an, uh, there has been an alarming and sudden spike in online human trafficking recruitment and the exploitation of children in Kenya, with concerns that this trend will continue for as long as children are at home and online due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, India has now been identified as a new sex trafficking route, with cases of ladies being lured into the country with the promise of a better job registered by government. Once there, the passports are confiscated and they're forced into sex work to pay off the traffickers more East Africans. Are we still together, Ma? You've lost me. Two copper more. So in such cases, traffickers claim that this cash caters for travel and lodging expenses in card while bringing the ladies to India. And we've seen like between 2019 and 2020 August, the International Organization of Migration repatriated 12 women who had been trafficked to India 
first time this has ever happened. Like IOM has never been asked for help to repatriate Kenyans in India. So this route has now started becoming worrying. Uh, a recent report by ENACT uh, stated that Kenya exports its labor mainly to the Middle East and to a lesser extent to Europe, the United States and Africa. So most Kenyans migrating to and acute violation of terms of employment. Uh, our other worrying thing is, as Jitok have noticed, that our country has become a major human smuggling hub in East Africa, with new emerging spots in the country. Uh, there's a report by Heart Kenya, which is one of our partners. Uh, it projects that there will be an increase in human trafficking in the country due to COVID-related related poverty and social ills. We've also seen towns like Moyale continue to be in to be flagged out as drugs and human trafficking hotspots. Ethiopia. And there are significant numbers of trafficking houses where victims on transit to UAE are held by their traffickers. And these trafficking houses are run by Kenyans in Dubai. And these houses, they house other East African nationals, such as Uganda, Burundi, and Tanzania. Uh, most of these victims, they lack proper employment papers and are victims of well-established human trafficking rings in East Africa, who operate under the gas of the geese, the geese, under the geese of employment agencies. And we've seen, according to reports, almost every month, the Kenya Director of Crim Directorate of Criminal Investigation reports at least one interception involving victims from Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, and to a lesser extent, Tanzania, and an indication that most of the trafficking takes place in and through Kenya. Uh, part of human trafficking also in, involves child labor, and we've also seen children lured into commercial sex tourism, heavy in areas such as Nairobi and Kisuman on the coast, coastal informal settings. And we've seen children are victims of commercial exploitation in drug production sites or near gold mines and along major highways. And some of them are even exploited sexually by fishermen on the of Lake Victoria. So it's this dynamics that makes us think as data that the time is ripe to have this discussion. It's the right time. And um, we feel like uh, we need to do more. We need to create more awareness. We need to shout more about this program problem. And I, I would like to thank all the team of experts who are here who uh, chose to all uh, happy deliberation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joyce Kimani. Joyce Kimani is the regional director for the Global Initiative. Their focus has, is, is working in and around uh, the curbing of organized crime. Um, thank you so much, Joyce. It has been a pleasure to have you, and also it's a pleasure to, to have your assistance in, in making this um, very possible to, to happen. I'd like of I'd like now to bring into the discussion our other partner. Our other partner is represented here very well by Elizabeth Kabari and Sophie Muriuki. I will let uh, Sophie Muriuki, uh, no Elizabeth Kabari, talk us through a bit about what Heart Kenya does. So Elizabeth, over to you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, or depending on wherever you are, good time of the day to you. My name is Elizabeth Kabari. I am the legal consultant at Awareness Against Human Trafficking, Heart Kenya. Uh, Sophie and I both work for the same organization. Heart Kenya is a counter trafficking organization that was begun in 2010. So we have 10 years of work under our belt. And uh, we work with victims of trafficking and we also work with governments to try and show up counter trafficking efforts. And um, we work with other CSOs who are working in this space and partnering with people like IOM um, and their voluntary, it's called voluntary migration program to bring back um, victims of trafficking, particularly from the Middle East. Um, so we use the 4P approach to counter trafficking, which is, the standard approach, I guess, across the board proposed by the United Nations. We have prosecution, uh, which is mostly legal work. We have protection, which is where Sophie comes in, in terms of um, assisting victims and helping them process trauma through psychosocial support. We have uh, prevention, which 
is about raising awareness and creating in, like disseminating information about what traffic how trafficking manifests and how we can be safer as people who are traveling and as people who are looking for jobs in other countries and then we have partnership and policy which is um where we work with government organizations and other NGOs and uh we seek to mostly conduct research on emerging issues particularly with regards to trafficking and also just you know make sure that we have a strong collaboration when we come across victims and we are able to refer stroke assist when necessary um yeah i think those are all the salient points so thank you for inviting me to this conversation i think i'll hand over to sophie for her to introduce herself good morning good afternoon good day everyone um thank you so much for the honor and i'm humbly grateful to just have the opportunity to have this conversation as well um sophie morioki i'm a clinical psychologist consultant based in nairobi kenya um and so um, as betty has said that i i do consult and i'm the in-house therapist at, at heart kenya um yeah and i'm just looking forward to seeing how we can continue to raise awareness um, against this vice that goes on globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Sophie. I want at this point to bring in Mohammed. Mohammed, please introduce yourself and let these beautiful people watching us know uh, a bit about what you do, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omeka, first for having me on your panel. It is such a privilege to, to be part of uh, this conversation uh, in two ways. One with the experts uh, who work on issues of human trafficking, and secondly, to engage with uh, the audience who have tuned in uh, today. So it is a privilege uh, for myself. Uh, as Omeke, you've mentioned, my name is Mohamed Daga. I work for a Pan-African think tank called the Institute for Security Studies. Uh, we have offices around uh, Africa, and our work mainly looks at issues of human security. Specifically, I work for a project called ENACT that stands for Enhancing Africa's Capacity uh, to uh, combat transnational organized uh, crime. This is a fully funded EU project. It is funded by the European Union and it is implemented through uh, observatories, what we call the regional organized crime observatories uh, that are placed uh, around Africa. I am the coordinator of uh, the Eastern Horn of Africa Observatory uh, for ENACT and it is implemented by three partners, ourselves as the ISS. Uh, we also work directly with uh, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, that is the GI talk, uh, represented uh, very well here by Joyce Kimani. And we also work with uh, Interpol. And we do our work mainly on two things. One is providing evidence-based analyses on uh, issues of transnational organized crime categorized uh, to around maybe 13 different types of organized crime, including trafficking in persons and also human smuggling. And we also uh, give what we call implementation needs to stakeholders uh, that include law enforcement uh, agencies and non-law enforcement uh, agencies. So in a nutshell, uh, basically that is uh, what we do. Uh, you can see our work uh, in our website. It is available at www.enactafrica.org. So, uh, Omeka, that is me and that is uh, my organization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mohammed. That's a, that's a very packed, it's a very packed resume we have there. And I'm sure you're already seeing that we're going to be having a very interesting and informative discussion. I want to take this time to introduce a gentleman by the name of Dave Erjok. Dave Erjok, I've had the opportunity to work with him on a number of productions as an artist, but I also know he has uh, a lot more proficiencies that he off offers as a person himself. So I let Dave Erjok please introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know about you. Dave, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully you all woke up okay today. 
Uh, my name is David Dog. I am a South Sudanese. Um, I am a multimedia journalist, but I am here today as a creative. Over the course of this year, I've had the privilege to work with um, uh, Enigma and the like of um, um, Hot Kenya. I've been very privileged, you can say that, to have an eye open up, you know, as I work with this organization, because I think um, human trafficking has existed in my field of work or in my community. Um, you know, it's being practiced and literally being accepted as culturally accept acceptable. And working with, um, you know, Hard Kenya, I've been able to have an eye opening um, in how it goes. And so far, I've been able to use my art to voice uh, the issues uh, that are facing um, the community, the community that I come from, and the things that we practice. And today, I'm very privileged to be able to join this um, this well-informed and from a different uh, work of life. And I'm looking forward to very, you know, productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. And what better way to begin the discussion by jumping straight into the subject matter? So, ladies and gentlemen, and my panel today, today is the International Day for the Abolition, Abolition of Slavery. I want to ask uh, Mohammed to briefly tell us, particularly because of his line of work, what new thing are we celebrating this year that has improved since last year's celebration? If you can run us through generally, Mohammed. I think with respect to issues of uh, human trafficking, this has been a very interesting year for, for everything. Uh, and largely, thanks and no thanks uh, to the pandemic at hand that we are facing. It has been such a, a, a disruptive uh, you know, a disease uh, that has disrupted almost anything and everything around the world. When we look at issues of uh, human trafficking, we, and I think Joyce alluded to this uh, when she, she was pointing out, uh, we are having most countries in Africa now qualifying as a source, transit, and destination uh, of, of victims of trafficking. But uh, from March, uh, where most countries registered uh, the presence of human trafficking, we have noticed uh, a reduction uh, of the movement of people. Uh, uh, being trafficked to other places, whether it is internally or within uh, borders. So with that, we have seen a drastic reduction compared to the same time uh, last year where the movement was uh, still uh, ongoing. But uh, that is not really a win uh, to say that because we have witnessed victims being stranded in destination countries uh, facing turmoil on uh, you know uh, not being able uh, to be rescued and i'm happy heart is here and they can allude more to this in the efforts that they've been working particularly for if i if i may to use kenya uh, as an example uh, where we had kenyans stranded uh, uh, in Lebanon, for example, we had Kenyans uh, stranded in Saudi Arabia. We had Kenyans uh, stranded uh, in the UAE. In April, for example, there was a repatriation fr flight from the United Arab Emirates to Kenya. And there was a distress call of over 300 uh, workers who were stranded. They were victims of trafficking from the UAE. But out of these 300, only 13, that is one three, uh, managed to board the flight as most of them uh, could not, you know, afford uh, the one-way ticket cost uh, to come uh, back into into the uh, back to Kenya. We also have uh, situations where workers uh, have not been paid their salaries; they are unable to send remittances uh, back home. Uh, the Kenyan embassy is uniquely challenged. Uh, you know that we have Kenyans present in over 140 countries, uh, but we only have 54 uh, embassies. Uh, around the world, and uh, the ministry points out that this, their staff are overwhelmed uh, as every case right now from students uh, to workers to vacationists is an emergency. So with issues of, uh, if I'm to make it uh, larger uh, on issues of slavery, is that uh, 
the change has seen a drastic reduction of movement of victims of trafficking, but uh, you know the harm is still there. So th that is what I will I, I will submit to Mecca. Thank you so much, Mohammed. I'd ask Elizabeth Kabari. Elizabeth, you work in the legal and policy field. Since we celebrated this day on 2nd of December last year, what new developments can we as a people celebrate this year? In as far as probably your experience in handling litigation and law and policy is concerned. Elizabeth. Uh, I don't know if there's much to celebrate given the kind of year that we've had as a universe. Um, but at least from Hart's point of view, we've had we had one significant win last year, December, when um, a court ruling was given to re repatriate Nepalese and Indian victims of trafficking who had been brought to Kenya for exploitation. And um, we managed to obtain court orders that um, enabled them to return to their countries while their case was still going on. And also their return was facilitated by the government. So the government is the one that actually paid for their flights and you know made all the arrangements for them to return. And that was our first in Kenyan history. And I think that is the only thing that comes to mind when it comes to things that we can celebrate because I think Mohammed has covered it quite um, well in terms of the pandemic has exacerbated a lot of the issues that we already had. And particularly in trafficking, the issues were many. So the pandemic came and made these issues worse. And so we have the issue of, you know, um, as Mohammed had mentioned, victims being stranded, particularly in the Middle East, you're told to pay for your flight back home. I think we all know how the cost of flights kind of skyrocketed sometime between, I want to say June, July, August. Actually, no, from April. April, May, June, July, August. For the flights that were coming in um, or going out, the cost had really escalated. And given the nature of trafficking, it's impossible. Okay, not possible. It's not impossible, but it's um, illogical to expect that victims will be able to cover the cost of their flights. Um, so the victims are stranded in countries of um, exploitation and they are unable to come home and they even getting support in terms of shelters in their countries of exploitation is an issue because shelters were closed um, when the pandemic hit because of COVID concerns, which are valid, but we need to be more responsive in terms of the policies and the rules that we make around how we shall address the pandemic. Because also when now the, what's it called? When the sky, not the skies, the air, flights, let's call them flights. When flights were suspended, um, there were instances where countries were getting their people home. So depending on the country, your country of nationality, you actually had access to private flights, so to speak. But that was not an option for victims, particularly Kenyan and African victims of trafficking, because those were not arrangements that the Kenyan government made. So they were stranded, whereas other people had flights. And um, I remember there was, we were working with the caseworkers sometime in April when now um, international flights had been banned the world over for the most part. And when we called the embassy to ask for help, we were told if we can charter our own flight, then the victims who we are looking to assist can come home. And uh, for me, it was quite baffling because um, I don't know anyone who has the money to charter a flight, like their own private flight. I don't, I don't know anyone who has that money either as an organization or as a person. So that was quite frustrating. And then also things like access to healthcare. Victims are told that in order to go home, you need to get tested. Um, I don't know what the cost is in other countries, but in Kenya currently, getting tested in a private facility costs you about 6,000 bob, uh, which is about, what, 60 USD, um, which people may not have access to that money. And even though you have access to that money, you have more pressing needs because of the, the economic uncertainty that was created by the pandemic. So things like those. And, you know, when you look at it from an aspect of maternal health care, I think there was an expose or a story rather that was done by Kenyans in Lebanon. 
and the struggles they had had, particularly with accessing healthcare and all the other things I've mentioned. So I don't know if there's been much to celebrate in the last 12 months, but um, things were looking up as of December 31st, 2029. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'd like, you know, we, we have, we, we've already jumped into the discussion. We are talking about slavery, we're talking about human trafficking, but then I want to help our viewers with something small. I need us to put the word slavery and let's start with slavery and its relation to human trafficking into today's context. You know, some people are probably looking and imagining what are these people talking about? They're talking about slavery. Nobody's being told to pick cotton. Nobody's being told, nobody's being whipped left, right and center. But then what is the definition of slavery in today's context? And I'd like to bring in uh, some of the panelists, before I bring in you, uh, Sophie and Dale, I'd like to pick the mind of uh, Mohammed. Mohammed, if you could give us a, a contextual description of what slavery looks like today, so that our viewers benefit. Mohammed. Yeah, I, I, I mean, if, if we put it today, then we are looking at more than slavery, if we are to qualified uh, like that but we we know that uh, you know the definition of modern slavery uh, is something that uh, does not really exist in in, in terms of uh, you know legal mechanisms or framework uh, of implementation but just to look at the issue of slavery today and contextualize it uh, look I, I see it like this I see it like uh, a commodity uh, that is non-living, uh, for example, with respect to a human being. So I'll give an example of a modern, uh, a modern uh, vacuum cleaner, where you pay for it once, uh, use it. Uh, once it fries up or it gets spoiled, you dispose it, assuming that we are using the current realities where, you know, uh, when something is spoiled, repairing it costs almost 75% uh, of the cost. So it is the commodification of a human being. Uh, using a human being as a commodity. And I, I think if there's a worse form of, uh, of looking into things as human beings, then this would be it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at it and who is uh, vulnerable is that uh, everybody is vulnerable, regardless of, of the social class where one is from. But the most vulnerable are the ones who, you know, I'll put this in quotes, the people who, you know, termed loosely as uh, the lower class uh, people of our society, you know, people who are engaged in manual labor types of jobs. And sadly, sadly enough, uh, women and children, both boys and girls, are the most hit in this form of crime. And I think we need to see it as a crime and we need to see it as a, as a transnational organized crime. It is transnational, yes, trafficking happens both inside a country and within countries. It is organized because there are people uh, behind it. Uh, and there is extremely huge, uh, huge money that is involved in slavery and uh, human trafficking. Uh, I mean, uh, statistics from a 2017 study by the International Labor Organization, you know, places the profits that traffickers earn from this trade at 150 billion uh, US uh, dollars. Uh, these are the estimates that we're looking at uh, in modern uh, times. So there's big money involved in commodification uh, of people. And that is how I would, you know, I will contextualize the issue of slavery in today's world. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Uh, I believe now we have we have a we have a, a grounding on on what on what slavery is. But then now I'd like to also just ask Elizabeth before I go into the line of questioning I have for Sophie and Daniel. Elizabeth, then how do we connect slavery to human trafficking? How do we link them up together? Uh, 
slavery is okay i think i don't know if my definition is slightly different from mohammed's uh, but i'd like to begin with it just in case it is um slavery is using is exerting rights of ownership over people so owning someone in any way shape or form for me is what slavery is and it's a form of exploitation and if trafficking is the transportation transference or harboring etc of people for the purpose of exploitation then when you do it when you transport or harbor people for the purposes of slavery then you have trafficked them so that is how the two things align or overlap thank you so much elizabeth right now i'd like to bring in i'd like to bring in uh, david jock dave dave you identify as as a refugee i i personally love your work as an artist and your 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 your, your ambition and your need to make sure that authentic stories are told surrounding uh, the status of people uh, people like refugees and other minority groups that you're passionate about i'd like to ask you what in your experience do you feel is not being talked about that we need to talk about in this conversation on human trafficking and modern and, and slavery Dave. uh thank you enigma for the question uh, just like Mohammed said and Elizabeth, um, as a refugee, I mean, the extreme exploitation of um, of young people and of refugees is something that exists in today's world, and we are hardly talking about it. Um, this exists in form of, um, you can say, for example, um, refugees are paid or hardly paid. You, you, you will find some time, most of them would go like a couple months without the pay. That is exploitation. Um, in terms of trafficking. So in my own context, slavery is something that is still exists and refugees given their vulnerability and their marginalized, marginalization of, um, you know, the notion that I base around refugees, um, you know, um, stories, they become victims, potential victims mostly because they're vulnerable and they do not, they do not know their rights. And since they live in other foreign countries, it kind of becomes hard for them, you know, to be able to um, have the kind of security that the other national, um, you know, access, have access to. So refugees in my own contact are mostly vulnerable to this human trafficking in today, um, in today's world, today modern world, because exploitation is happening all around us. Um, I have witnessed a couple um, in my line of work. I didn't know it was uh, slavery and didn't know it was trafficking until I was enlightened by the kind of course that I took with Heart Kenya. So in my own context, having to speak out against these things and having to be on this platform talking about them, you know, um, give light. And it kind of gave an opening, uh, eye opening to the other youth to be able to tell what kind of exploitation they should be able and what kind of right they should have, you know, before they get themselves involved in uh, any kind of exploitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. At this point, I want to ask uh, Sophie. Sophie, you have you work as the resident uh, psychologist or slash psychiatrist. I, I stand to be corrected uh, for Heart Kenya. The question I have for you is, you, you, you have most likely met these people, the ones who have been in these situations. You have worked with the people who are frontline, frontline assistants when it comes to rescuing and securing the well-being of, of people who have experienced trafficking and, and slavery and all the activities that lead up to its, uh, to its occurrence. In your experience handling the counseling process for them, what information do you have to share for us that you, need, you feel we need to know about as people who are probably detached from the entire cycle of information? Sophie. 
Thanks, Omeka. Um, let me start by clarifying that um, I'm a clinical psychologist, not a psychiatrist. I'm not a doctor. I can't prescribe medication. Um, so for 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 clinical psychologists, we start off with assessing the situation, um, and from there we're able to determine the amount of distress an individual is going through and then develop a treatment plan that we believe will be um, suitable for a particular individual facing psychological distress. Um, so in terms of my experience with um, victims, or I'd, I prefer calling them survivors, I think the thing I'd like to highlight is that even we we all not we all but we tend to engage in modern slavery so to speak um, with vulnerable populations. Um, so when we talk about individuals who are, for instance, seeking asylum in our country, uh, let me give that as an example. So you find that some people tend to engage them in some sort of economic um, expectation, or you rec you want them to work for you. But then because you know they don't enjoy the same rights and liberties as you do as a citizen of this country, then you don't give them pay that is commensurate with the work they've done. I believe that's a, home of, a form of, of exploitation in that you're denying this person what is owed to them. They've done the work, so pay them their dues. Because at the end of the day, this is an individual just trying to make it day by day and trying to survive in a certain country. And so then already they're in a point of dehumanization. And so when we engage in this kind of behavior, we dehumanize them further. When we deny them services, we dehumanize them further. Um, when we deny them support as a human being, again, we're dehumanizing them. So for me, I'd like to highlight that, ensuring that they're able to enjoy liberties as a human being, um, bearing in mind they may not be a citizen, but then we should also be able to um, support each other as human beings and be able to just get the person the suitable help and support that they need. And if, I mean, so long as they're not engaging in illegal activities, they're not doing the same to someone else, so why then should we deny them the support and encouragement that they need in this, in this time? Um, the other thing I, I think I'd like to highlight is that mental health is mental health whether you're dealing with um, a Kenyan, a Canadian, uh, an individual from Pakistan, it doesn't matter. Mental health is mental health. And it's important that we do whatever we can in trying to ensure that, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting for the well-being of an individual. We're fighting for, for the fact that this person can live their normal life, um, whether it's in terms of occupationally, socially speaking, they can fend for themselves and for their families. And so we all need that support to engage in our own mental health or well-being activities. So then my, 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 I think, take home is support, 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 and let's just hold hands and stand together. Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, the message there is support, support, support. Hold hands and let us work together. Now, there, 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 there are a number of, of issues surrounding. There are a number of issues surrounding um, the topic of discussion we are talking today. We are having today. We had had Elizabeth talk earlier on about uh, what different things that we may we may feel that we can celebrate about the discussion on today's topic. But then I'd like to throw the ball over to Elizabeth add a bit of context in as far as as you know the law is concerned. Elizabeth, in, in your knowledge and your line of work, are there any protection policies that protect survivors of human trafficking? I know of course the country, Kenya is really good at making policies they are made every day. And skeptics have said that implementation has always been a big a big ball game where there's a lot of talk but not much is executed. But I'd like to hear from you and silence the rumors. Uh, please tell us if there are any protection policies that are 
attached specifically to survivors of human trafficking? Are they being implemented? And also, if you could talk us through any existing gaps in both the response and protection of survivors, and also whose responsibility is it? I know it's a very packed question, but we can chew at it as we go. Elizabeth. Um, okay, so I'll start with the first question with regards to laws, and I'll piggyback off what Dave talked about when he talked about victims knowing their rights. And I think it's important for everyone to know that the basis for all, particularly in Kenya, the basis for all laws and the basis for everything that we're supposed to do is our constitution, which has a very vibrant bill of rights that safeguards most like most of the important rights, you have the right to dignity, you have the right to freedom and security of the person, which um, translates to you should be, no one should um, subject you to violence, whether it's public actors or private actors. We have the right to fair labor practices. We have the right to the highest attainable standard of health, which is both mental and physical. We have um, the protection of specific groups like youth, um, who should be, you know, the, um, they should be encouraged to participate in economic life and children should be protected from, ex for, from economic exploitation. All of these things are in our constitution and that lays the foundation for the protection, for the recognition and protection of everyone's rights, including victims of trafficking. Because um, one thing that I've learned, particularly this year, is many of us are one disaster away from desperation. So it's possible for any of us to become victims of trafficking because our economic, um, our economic stability is not guaranteed. Like a global pandemic has come and showed everyone that really whatever safety you thought you had, you don't have. Um, MPs used to be able to fly out to foreign countries when they were unwell. And then now all of us are unwell from the same thing and nobody knows what's going on. And you know, it caused a panic. So. We have all learned that we are vulnerable in one way or another, and we are all susceptible to the same weaknesses because we are all human. So trafficking is, I don't think trafficking is any different. So people are trafficked usually because they are looking for better for themselves and better for their families. Um, so the laws that we have to protect victims of trafficking are really laws that we have to protect everyone. So we have things like the Employment Act, which talks about the rights of employees. You should have contracts. Your contract should be signed. Your contract should entitle you to leave. Your contract should um, entitle you to maternity leave, sick leave. That's what I meant by leave. And it should state your who you report to. It should state what your job is and what it entails. And that is a right that everyone should, that everyone has actually under Kenyan law. So you have you look at the Employment Act. You have things like um, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. It's called OSHA for short. So you look at OSHA and um, OSHA talks about working conditions. Um, organizations and institutions have an obligation to ensure their workers are safe, to ensure the health of their workers, depending on the work that you do. Your, your employer has an obligation to make sure that, for example, if you get injured while at work, you get um, your, like medically, you're, you're able to have medical support, um, things like those. And then now when you move particularly into counter trafficking, you have the Counter Trafficking in Persons Act, which now talks about people after the fact. So what happens with laws like Employment Act and OSHA is that they, they are more preventative they create a framework to prevent trafficking. Um, then now the Counter Trafficking Act comes in and addresses trafficking and thereafter. So it criminalizes the, as I've mentioned before, transportation, transfer, harboring of people, etc. There are many verbs um, of people for the purposes of exploitation. Um, so it criminalizes that and attaches a very hefty penalty of about no, not about 30 million um, Kenya shillings as a fine or imprisonment for 30 years, which is quite steep, given that usually criminal uh, sentences for like penal sentences are usually between 10 to 20 years. So 30 is quite um, high. 
And it also talks about the rights of victims and the obligation of the state when it comes to counter trafficking. So victims have a right to privacy. Um, their information should not be shared. Yes, this is a victim of trafficking, but it doesn't mean that their face should be on KTN or NTV or standard newspaper or whatever, unless they have expressly consented to that, then no. Um, their details should not be shared. Um, recently, it was last year, Hart had a case where um, there were some Indian and Nepalese victims of trafficking who a criminal case was instituted against their perpetrator and their names were right there on the charge sheet. The charge sheet is a document that lays the foundation for criminal prosecution. So the victims' names were there in the charge sheet, like all three names, which is a violation of the right to privacy. You have victims have a right to uh, medical support and psychosocial support. So because of the nature of trafficking, um, Omeka, you had mentioned that we don't have slavery where people are being whipped. We actually do have slavery where people are being whipped. Like it's a thing. It's not it's not a thing of the past. It's not okay. Maybe we don't no, even cotton pickers. If you look at what's going on with Kakuzi, it's the same thing. We have exploitation of people on plantations, whether they're growing flowers, whether they're growing cotton, whether they're growing sugarcane, exploitation is exploitation is exploitation. So um, we also have cases of, you know, people being subjected to physical harm when they don't work or there's a common I Unfortunately, I learned about this during Ramadan this year. Um, there's a common practice, particularly for victims who are trafficked to the Middle East, of being denied food because it's Ramadan. So you work a 15, 16 hour day and you refuse to eat during normal work hours because it's Ramadan. And even when the family are eating in the evening, you are refuse to eat until everyone has eaten. And if you're found eating, you're actually beaten. And, and beaten, like properly beaten, Kenyans would say kuchapwa kiunyama kind of thing. So it's a thing, it happens. And um, it's not a thing of the past. It's not, uh, you know, it's a thing for our history books. It's a present and actual threat to many people. So the Counter Trafficking Act also talks about things like those. For instance, if you die as a result of being trafficked, then your perpetrator serves an additional term for you know, that kind of harm that they have caused you. So we have the rights of victims on the one hand, and then we have the obligations of the state, which are to support victims of trafficking. And what does support look like? Support looks like enable them to access medical health, um, and it, no, medical services, yes, which are both mental and physical health services, enable them to access legal services. So I'll go back to what Dave mentioned about knowing your rights. The government has an obligation to make sure as a victim of trafficking upon your rescue someone sits you down and explains to you these are your rights you have a right to participate in the trial if you want if you don't want it's okay you have a right to um work stay in for example if your country of exploitation is kenya you have a right to stay in kenya and actually the state has to facilitate your documentation such that you're able to work for as long as you want to stay here um, if there's a chance that you being repatriated to your country will put you in danger, you have a right to stay in Kenya indefinitely and the government has a duty to facilitate that. Um, then also you look at government um, obligations in terms of prosecuting. So they have an obligation to seize assets from people who are perpetrators and the proceeds of the sale of those assets goes towards the fund, which the, is a government fund that is supposed to go towards paying for all these things that victims have a right to. We have a lot of problems. Uh, I think Omeka, you had mentioned it with regards to implementation. We have the, the, the framework, the legal framework isn't perfect, but it's good enough. But even what we have on the books is not being translated into real life, which is why we have instances like the one I spoke of earlier, where despite the existence of the Counter Trafficking Act for 10 years now, the first time the government paid for flights for victims was December 2019. And that is a concern because implementation is not happening. So actually what happens is our framework is pretty decent. There are terms and like there could be improvements, but even the pretty decent framework we have is not being implemented at all. You or being implemented completely wrong. Instances where police tell victims, we will not repatriate you unless you testify, which is a complete violation of their rights or you tell uh, victims are told that you will not, um, you can't stay in Kenya unless you agree to testify. Like if they're scared to go home, then now they're threatened with the opposite. We'll deport you. Also, we are not supposed to be deporting victims. They're repatriated. The difference is a very big difference between deportation and repatriation. And that's something that 
is exploited and um, victims are threatened with that, you'll be deported. Um, so though that's what it looks like in terms of the legal framework. We have in, for policies, we have the national reference, referral mechanism, um, and then we have a few regulations that were passed under the Counter Trafficking Act, which were mostly supposed to be for implementation of the Act, but seeing as the Act is not being implemented, again, they're, they're just sitting in the law books and gathering dust. With regards to gaps, um, the gaps are many in terms of implementation is a gap, a very big gap. Um, also things like police not understanding the law when it comes to prosecution, prosecuting trafficking is quite difficult because of the issues of exploitation. For example, someone had mentioned um, private, private employment agencies. So how do you determine the culpability of a private employment agency that, so John is in Nairobi, and the agency approaches John and tells him they have a job for him in Qatar. And then he goes to Qatar and he ends up being exploited. Is the agency culpable in any way? What due diligence obligations did they have? Can you sue? Because now when he's exploited in Qatar, the only person you can sue in Kenya for his exploitation is the agency. So can you sue the agency? And what is your proof? How do you prove that the agency knew he was going to be exploited where they sent him to? So things like that. Those are some of the gaps that we have and we are trying to show up through the policy and partnership aspect of what we do. Um, yeah, I think that's it in a nutshell. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was very, that was comprehensive. I wouldn't imagine there's any information that has been left out. But I want to still pick your mind on something small that you have mentioned. So now, now we understand what human trafficking is. We know its correlation to slavery. We know it still happens in the country and in the world today. But then I have been able, based on this information, to identify somebody who I feel has is being exploited. So how do I help them? Where do I take them? Do I take them to the police? Is there a specific place I report them? Who will care enough with the information I have about somebody I have, who I know is being exploited or has been trafficked? Where do I report them? I feel like that's the only bit that we have at captured, Elizabeth. Ideally, trafficking should be reported to the police. Um, ideally. Practically, that the police are strapped in terms of knowledge and resources to address something like trafficking. But actually, to the government's credit, the TOKU, the Transorganized Crime Unit of the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, um, is actually doing a pretty bang up job of investigating trafficking. But then now the problem is access to some of these things because DCI is based in Nairobi. So if someone in Mombasa is being trafficked, um, how do you how do you access the very specific government um, mechanism that has been formed to deal with trafficking? That's an issue. So what happens is NGOs such as HART, um, some, I think it was Mohammed who had mentioned IOM, they come in and they fill the gap so you can report cases of trafficking to heart. We have a helpline that is available on our website. I can share it um, with Omeka just for future reference. Um, you can report cases to IOM. You can report cases to UNHCR. You can report cases to stop the traffic. Um, in Uganda, we have our partners who are Willow. You can, if you have a trafficking case in Uganda, Willow are the people to go to. Um, so. CSOs come and try and fill that gap as best they can. But then, of course, also, we do not have the kind of extensive resources that come from collecting tax from a, a citizenry. So to an extent, CSOs are limited in that way. We are dependent on donor funds. We are dependent on goodwill. But the primary, the primary, primary duty bearer is the government. 
And that is one of the things that we are most frustrated with because um, I had mentioned an expose that was done on Kenyans in Lebanon and some of the issues they raised in addition to healthcare was um, the government was doing nothing to help them. In fact, the consulate there, the consul, the consul there was actually um, hiking up prices for tickets, hiking up prices for visas, like they were not getting support. And if anything, their, their attempts to come back home were actively being hampered by their own government. So the government is a primary duty bearer and I think that's something that we need to remember. CSOs are supposed to, actually CSOs should not be doing government work, no matter how you cut it. Government should have people like Sophie on hand who can provide proper mental support, mental health support to victims. And this should be something that should be done for free because it is a right. Um, so, and there is a fund that is supposed to pay for it. So the victim should not bear this cost. Uh, so when you look at it from that point of view, the person to call would be the government, but unfortunately the government is not doing what it should and as much as it should. So now you fall on CSOs like HART and the, all the international organizations that I had mentioned. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, you have mentioned interesting- uh, I make my, just to add something on- Yeah, 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 sure. I oh, just, um, I think, thank you, Elizabeth. That was a uh, very informative um, information. I think what also that is very vital is social responsibility. As much as you know, there are laws and you know policies that are based uh, to protect refugees and vulnerable people. Social responsibility is something that is really, really vital. We have witnessed that when Enigma asked uh, earlier today, earlier on the conversation about what we celebrated, what we should celebrate this year. Um, I think we should also celebrate social responsibility because, given the advance of technology. We have seen um, how the world has become global. You know, we we have become one. And for example, what is happening in Kampala? I mean, Uganda. What is how ha what happened in Sudan? What also happened in America? We have seen how the world have come together. So social responsibility is really important. I mean, to the audience, social responsibility is really, really, really vital um, to be able to eradicate uh, this kind of practice in our community. Because if we keep quiet about it. Um, the like of hard Kenya, the like of government, you know, uh, will not be able to reach out or, you know, give um, help that, that is able to, you know, to facilitate their well-being. So social responsibility is something that we should also practice as individual. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. I want to quickly bring in Sophie before I, I, hand, I bring in uh, Mohammed. Uh, another question based on what Elizabeth has said. Sophie Morioki, we have we have established uh, we have established a chronology of events where we now know what human trafficking is, we know what slavery is, but then we have also identified somebody who is who is a victim and we feel we need to help them. So based on the information that Elizabeth has given us we have been able to, to bring them to a place where their grievances matter and they're being looked into. But then this person is, let's say, for, for instance, repatriated back home. Now, us, as the people who have to live with uh, the survivor, how should we handle them post-experience so that we do not infringe on the realities of the trauma that they have experienced. How do we go about generally handling them as beings in a way that is meaningful to their current state? Sophie. That's a very good question. And I like the approach that you've taken in, in terms of how to handle a survivor, I guess, as family, as friends, as a community. Um, so let me answer, how do I answer this? Let me answer first from the perspective of what we do at heart and then come to, to that so that, you know, to give some context. So uh, for, for us at heart, once um, a survivor has been identified, uh, 
um, or a victim of human trafficking. We're able to identify that, you know, and, and corroborate the story. Then for us, we look at it uh, as a management sort of thing in a collaborative process. So having people at heart from different backgrounds, whether it's um, individuals like Betty from the legal aspect, social workers. So we work as a team in, in the development of an approach to help this one individual um, just to you know process what has happened to them. So then the, the rehabilitation process um, really begins. Um, and in that capacity, then I come in to look at the mental health aspect of this individual. And the other stakeholders do other things like economic empowerment. If there's a case, then a legal aspect to it, then you know, Betty takes care of that. So when we're looking at the rehabilitation process, the idea is that um, I'm able to, for instance, determine, like I said before, the amount of distress. So one of the things that is very key in this process is establishing this person's social support system or their support network. So who do they have that they can turn to in case they feel overwhelmed outside of a therapy session, outside of a case consultancy meeting with one of the other individuals at heart. So we try and, and encourage our clients to um, build on their social support system. If they did not have one, then let's do work together and build it. So who do you live with? Where are your parents, where are other family members, siblings, relatives, and so on. So then you rope in these people in your treatment plan, in your attempts at getting better. And so the idea is that you're able to go home and you know, uh, turn to your, your family members and your friends and even your neighbors and even ask for help and say, um, maybe for example, this person has nightmares. Um, so then we can also teach this person techniques uh, that they can also teach their family members and other persons of the support system on what to do should they start having nightmares and then maybe have an anxiety attack. So we teach them relaxation and stabilization techniques that they can teach to others so that these others can now help them to ground them because this is happening at 3 a.m. By the time you think of picking up your phone and calling someone at heart, you know, time is, is, is of the essence. If it's now talking about a suicidal individual, then usually one of the things that we do is when, when you've gotten the person's contact number, we always, always, always need to have like an in case of emergency contact. So then if I'm talking to this person and realize that they're suicidal, then I know um, beyond developing a safety plan and just establishing how much of a risk they are to themselves, then we need to get in touch with some sort of person or guardian in their lives, a caretaker if they're under 18, just to notify them and tell them this is what you're dealing with and this is how we need to respond. So your loved one is having thoughts of suicide. Will, if necessary, if necessary, we refer them on to like a psychiatrist for medication. If not, then we tap into all these other resources around them. So when you come back to your question of um, how do I better support a survivor? Imagine just make it as basic as possible. Ask this person, how can I support you? What do you need? What can I do? So hoping that their necessities are met, their basics are met. They have a roof over their heads, food in their belly. If they're sick, they have medication. What can I do? What else do you need? Um, do you need space? Do you need someone to talk to? Sometimes even based on their past experience, some people don't want to talk to anybody. Some people want to spend time on their own. They withdraw. But there are things that you can do. Maybe they just want you to sit with them in silence. And imagine that's okay. We don't always have to look for an opportunity to feel the silence. Because sometimes we get so wrapped up in trying to think, oh my God, what can I say? What can I do? That you end up saying things that are just not very supportive. Um, you know, including saying things like, uh, you've been back for eight months, snap out of it. That's not very helpful. If anything, now you're reminding this person how weak they are because they are already torturing themselves about it that they've been back for so long and they're not able to get out of bed and find work and so forth. So when you say support non-supportive things like that, then you're just sending them back. Find out from them what other support they need. And then even for you, look at the situation and see, do they have their basic necessities met? Do they have food and water and shelter and clothing? And if you see a gap in that area, do what you can to support this individual. 
So for we at heart, we try and do um, things in a different sort of way in terms of, like I was saying before, collaborative. So we look at not only their mental health, but also how can we help this person build up their social skills. Um, they went away to the UAE, for example, for work. What is it they were going to work as? What else can they do? So what happens is even when you show this person that you care and that you're willing to support, then you end up um, building their resolve. You end up uh, enhancing their self-esteem and their sense of worth. So we all want to be valued. We all want to feel like we're worthwhile. So when you do these things and, and show support as and when necessary, then you're also helping this person develop their sense of worth and it becomes a cycle. So they, they, they then get encouraged little by little and they're able to stand up on their own two feet. Um, if there are other things that you can think of to help this person, if you know other organizations that are maybe training in you know, basic skills or soft skills, whether it's tailoring, carpentry, and you're able to hook them up with that, and why not? So think outside the box, depending on who you're dealing with, and look at the resources that you may have around you or the connections you have that you know would help this person just get to a place of healing. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was very informative. Um, I you know we have this tendency to imagine that something like this when it happens to someone close to you, there's a specific textbook definition of what you should and shouldn't do. But now you need to get cracking and learning and then you begin to treat them like an egg. And, and sometimes what they really want is for you to just listen and leave the moment with them because almost always they also don't know what they want. And you are showing that you understand that is, is, a, is a first step. So thank you so much. Sophie. Now, I want to... I want sorry, to if I may add, sorry. Yes, please. Yes, please. Sure. I, I think having said that, what, um, what you've, how you've put it, like we always look for a textbook way of responding. I think I also want to take this opportunity to celebrate our community because sometimes, uh, and I think even Elizabeth can attest to this, we often get calls at heart from community members, neighbors of people who may have gone and come back or who are you know, sometimes that um, neighborliness is not lost in our in our society. In as much as we've become very self-driven, it's not all, it's not all bad. So sometimes we do get people reaching out and saying they're concerned about a neighbor or a loved one, and you know, tapping into a resource like Heart and us seeing whether the Heart can help. So that's also something that we should celebrate. Or sometimes people go to the police or, you know, find some other sort of organization to help. So I feel like I should highlight that as well, that those who already do that should not stop and those who haven't started should start. Thank you so much, Sophie. I want to uh, bring in Mohammed. Uh, I want to bring in Mohammed with a question. And after that, I will, uh, I will go and read the comments. And then we'll have Dave answering our question as well as blessing us with our performance. So, Mohammed, in my research preparing for this for this topic today, I came across a very heavily implicated statement that human trafficking is a crime that most oftenly is transborder. It's it, it doesn't define like confine itself within specific borders it's um and it, that makes it that much harder for people to actually effectively handle it because there's a lot of red tape associated with who is responsible for what who has jur jurisdiction where uh, so i'd like you to probably comment on this nature of this particular crime even as we tie down the discussion Mohammed. I think uh, you are right, uh, uh, Omeka. Uh, yeah, I mean, human trafficking is is both. It's both uh, within uh, borders, and it's also uh, between or within uh, 
countries. So, for example, uh, you contextualize this. I think uh, the most prevalent or categorized form of uh, human trafficking is twofold. One is on issues of uh, forced labor. Uh, and by forced labor here, I mainly look at uh, issues, uh, for example, domestic workers, uh, the hospitality industry, uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, whether it's textile or what have you. And this is perceivably mainly targeting women. And then you look at agriculture, construction, mining for men. So uh, this happens both within a country and also uh, between two or more countries. And it's subtle. It is hiding in plain sight. I think it, it becomes very difficult then, you know, to nab it because a trafficking uh, victim or a trafficking act can be happening uh, right in front of your eyes. And uh, it, it, it might be very difficult, you know, uh, to, to, to really place it uh, how it is actually taking place. And uh, we have the legal experts here and they will attest to that. Uh, and it's not specific only to the Kenyan government, but also in many other legal frameworks is that consent with or without it, uh, you know, does not matter. Uh, you are a victim of trafficking, whether you consent to do it, uh, whether you put your signature or your thumbprint to it, uh, or you were actually uh, forced uh, first threat, kidnapped, ad abducted, you know, or other means of uh, deception uh, that take place. So I think it happens in both. Uh, the issue is that it can be, you know, hiding uh, just uh, right in front of you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for that, for that uh, contextual look at the transnational nature of transnational, transborder nature of, of the, the crime of human trafficking and, and slavery. Right now I want to bring in, uh, I want to go straight to the comments and uh, highlight uh, a few of what the people on our feed are saying. So we have, we have, uh, we've had an, an, an interesting engagement. I'm seeing we have a gentleman here who was with us from the beginning, he's called Karanja Wangoi. Karanja Wangoi says to go inside Kabisa. For those of you who are watching from the diaspora and do not understand the French he's speaking, he's saying we are tuned in and we are locked. We have Priscilla Musumbi, we say morning all the best guys. Thank you so much, Priscilla. We have Mburu who says hello, hello. We have also Mungai Dennis who says we are good, we are good. And then we have a gentleman called Mungai Dennis again. I think this is a poem. I'll probably read through it. It's a short one. He's called the Evangelical Poet. He says, Jani to the east, Usimane na nini. Jani huku ujue, my jani, Nigeria, Uganda, siyopokee, kwenikeo, sizimistani. Pia huku kwa watu wako stripped of their freedom, wanavishwa nguo za utumwa. Huku ni tears na ninagundua kila ni. I'm free in the gift of God, Huku, Nitapaza Kilio, in hopes of Kuzima, Easy Crimes, Zinakula Watuangu. Evangelical Poet. Thank you so much, Evangelical Poet. Elias Mungai Dennis again tells us that he can, he can give us an English one. He can also double in English. We appreciate you, Mungai. Mungai also says, just sharing. That stands. I have written a whole piece just by listening to this conversation. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm, uh, Mungai. We have Heart Kenya. Heart Kenya, our partners, they are saying they are glad that all of you who are joining us will actually join us today. Clinton says, great discussion. We have Lincoln saying, okay, Lincoln now is talking to Clinton. <laughs> Lincoln, great discussion. And Julia's awesome discussion. Kate Yvonne says informative discussion, and we have John Mutua saying good discussion. Now, I want to invite Dave. Dave, I have a question for you, even before you perform for us. Dave, I have known you as an artist. I love your work. I have been privileged enough to work on a number of productions with you. And I know that you're an actor in the field of, uh, oh, you disappeared. Where did 
Dave and Joe can go back to you. So I was going to say that Dave works in the field of art and he has he has had experience in um uh, in, in, in what what art can do to make mistakes better for discussions such as this. Probably before before he rejoins us with the performance. I'd like to throw the question over to the panelists who are in. Are there actors within other fields that you feel their inclusion into this discussion would help make the discussion broader, reach more people? For example, Dave is an artist. Who do you feel will be helpful in uh, in coming on board with the discussion so that it's it's impactful and it reaches uh, a wider range of people? This could be bullet form answers, this could be two, three sentences, whichever way you feel to answer. I will start with you, Sophie. Um, I think anyone with a voice uh, or in a position of leadership, that because they tend to have a following um, or some level of influence within the community, so be it be a politician, uh, maybe let me speak to my own field um, within the mental health. If we look at people uh, or people that are influencers within the mental health field in our country, those are people who would probably be able to give support because then they would be able to highlight an area of need. Um, and I'm even thinking just across uh, the board in terms of psychology, psychiatrists, counselors, Anyone in, in the mental health field has the capacity to, to, to help because then what will happen is then they would rope in other colleagues and just get the help that is needed out there because you, you find that a lot of psychological support is needed um, over and above what we're able to do as HART. It's needed and I guess the, the, it all comes down to the cost factor. The, there's, a, there's a cost implication to it. And so what can we do to come together and offer the support that is needed um, and the care that is needed? And it's not just the survivors that need care. Um, when you spoke about how to best support, families are struggling. Families of, of people who've been trafficked are struggling. They don't know how to adjust. They don't know how, they don't know what to do. Is their person alive or dead? Um, will they ever come back? So it's important to be able to, to get them the support they need um, in as much as finding their loved one and giving them the, the psychological balance. So anyone in a position of leadership, I think, should be roped in in whatever field. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, Elizabeth. I think... I don't know whether it's me and my activism, but um, I think one of the things that we can all do is be more, how do I put this, cognizant of, for example, our, our, the people we vote in. Because as I noted, the problem with the Counter Trafficking in Persons Act and even just our Bill of Rights is implementation. And the person tasked with implementation is the government. So who is the government that you're voting in? And is this part of their plan? Because this, especially trafficking of Kenyans to the Middle East or trafficking of other people through Kenya is something that happens. Like everyone knows either someone who has gone through it or a family member or like it's the degrees of separation are not that many. And in order for us to start having implementation, I think we start... We need to start with having leaders who we hold accountable. So are we holding our leaders accountable? One of the cheapest ways to do it is at the ballot. Are we doing that at the ballot? Like, do you look at your, when you go to vote, do you look and see what has my MP done? This guy elected for president, what has he done? What has been, how has he helped implement laws that keep me and my family safe, implement laws that keep me and my neighbor safe, that enable us to access economic opportunities? That's something we can all do. And there's something Dave mentioned that I felt was very important um, when it comes to social responsibility. Another thing we can all do is stop exploiting our neighbors. 
yes, trafficking happens in a, in a transnational um, setting, but it also happens within Kenya. The pra I, I say this a lot, the practice that we have of you go up country and then you find a cousin, a nephew, um, who, you know, is not doing so well, um, their family is not doing so well economically. And then what you do is you say how you're going to bring this child to Nairobi and educate them. And then what you do is you bring them to Nairobi and you decide they are your domestic work. And you don't pay them because they should be grateful for the privilege of living in your home. And you mistreat them and the education that they were supposed to be getting, you're not giving them. In the case of children, they should not be a domestic help at all. Like if your domestic worker is below 18, you are a trafficker. It's a very ugly truth, and some of it is steeped in our culture, but these are the things that we need to um, evolve out of. So even you personally think about how much do you pay a domestic worker? Do you pay them, like, do you pay them enough that uh, money that is commensurate to the work they do? And we can't say that the work they do is not a lot because it is December. Every year when domestic workers go on leave in December, families are always like, oh my God, we can't wait for her to come back. Like it's a, it's a genuine feeling that is there and it's widespread. So how much do we pay our domestic workers? The lady who cleans your house, how much do you pay her? Do you pay her? Um, when you're, if you look at it locally, I had spoken about Kakuzi before, these flower farms, do we think about the state of the coffee farms, flower farms, uh, coffee plantations, flower farms? Do we think about the what is the conditions of the workers there? If you're a director in one of those companies, if you're a manager in one of those companies, what are your policies? These are things that you can actively do, like aside from the whole larger picture of voting and elections and whatnot. For your part, you can say, I shall not be a trafficker, I shall not be an exploiter, I shall pay my people well, I shall give them access to, you know, um, health insurance, I shall enable them to take days off, which is a, a right. Days off are a right, it's not a favor you do anybody. So things like that. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Mohammed, which other actors do you feel we need? Uh, you, you feel need to join into the conversation. You see, Omeka, uh, mine will be, uh, mm, I think, which other actors should we not involve uh, in these issues? I, I would like to, to look at it differently. And the reason why I'm saying this is that uh, interventions currently in place, uh, mechanisms both legal and operational, uh, are focusing on the crime once it has taken place. Uh, we are looking at it once something happens, how are we going to rescue that? But I think we need to also add uh, by rethinking this process on what made uh, that person become a victim or a survivor uh, in the first place. So we, we need to rethink of not really adding more people to solving this issue, but actually preventing it uh, or you know mitigating it from actually taking place. And uh, if we are looking at labor-related type of trafficking or sex-related type of trafficking and the different categories that are involved, uh, we need to you know come up with very comprehensive mechanisms on uh, preventing these things from happening uh, in the first place. If we are looking at an average of a thousand. Uh, people a year, we need to bring that down to dealing with only 20 people. And other countries have done it. Uh, we are not the only ones who are taking, using the classic example to Middle East, we are not the only ones who are taking uh, people to go work in the Middle Eastern countries. The Filipinos uh, are there, the Indians are there uh, in large uh, numbers. Uh, they face trafficking, yes, but not to the extent that we do. You know, so I would think of ways of first recognizing this as, a, as an issue of crime, an issue of organized crime, you know. Uh, let's come up with comprehensive ways that will mitigate or reduce uh, people from being, you know, in these uh, kind of situations. And, and there are a number of measures. Most of the legislations we have, there are many. I mean, we are oversaturated. Uh, if I'm to use Kenya as an example and not even touch on Uganda or Ethiopia for that matter, we are over legislated, we are oversaturated with laws. There are many, but they're not talking to each other. So we do not have a comprehensive policy in place. I'll give an example. 
you know, I mean, should I use Philippines? Should I use Kenya? We want a situation that you are taken to go and work in Beirut or in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that employment agency is registered. Before you go, you register your next of kin. There are phone numbers of your next of kin. There are phone numbers of who is going to employ you there. Your contract is uh, well elaborated on the leave days, uh, you know, the minimum wage. We want to have an NSSF type of model, a pension type of model of workers who go to these kind of countries. We want the duty bearer, who is basically the government, to have labor attaches who actually periodically visit our people in this country. Physical visit. How are you? How is it going? Are you working well? Where, where do you sleep? Are you sleeping in a toilet or are you sleeping in a particular decent quarters? And you report back to the embassy or the consulate or whatever kind of mechanisms that are there and you know periodically visiting this kind of things uh we want kenyans who are sending money back to uh, their country to be subsidized by government you know uh we want people to save uh money through pension schemes so that when they come back in this country it's easier to plug in uh back to the economy yes i did my five years seven years as a driver uh, in one of these countries i'm back now uh, in the process, I managed to save. The government has saved this for me. I've saved this for me through this circle, through this welfare uh, union. I've built my, you know, house or kibanda, whatever you want to do, or an apartment. You move forward like that. Uh, and I think this has been tested by other countries. And you, you will save time for Elizabeth and Sophie in dealing with some of these issues. And they will be dealing with the most perennial of the issues. Because we cannot have every issue for domestic worker going to those countries being an emergency we don't even have bilateral agreements with these countries we have one with saudi arabia which is not comprehensive we have another one that was signed by qatar in 2003 that is not operational so where exactly are we uh, i mean uh, the philippines are 17 with one country with workers who go you know they have even a specific a specific bilateral agreement for their people who work in the maritime sector a specific law only for that leave alone these domestic works leave alone construction leave alone uh, industries so we need that comprehensive foreign employment policy first in place and then we need mechanisms that we are going to protect our people and then now at least you'll make elizabeth and sophie enjoy christmas than being called to rescue someone you know, on Boxing Day. I, I mean, we need to... So, anyway, I, I will reserve my further comments on this, but uh, Omeka, I think we will need to rethink on who should we not add in solving these issues, then rather who should we add more in solving these issues. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mohammed. That was very aptly put. That was very, very aptly put. Thank you very, very much for that for that um, trail of thought. Dave, I, when you disappeared, thank you, by the way, for disappearing, because now we have something more that's added to the conversation. <laughs> yeah, but then in the, in the no, final two minutes of this, it's all good. In the, in the final two minutes of this uh, live feed, I'd like you to uh, give us a performance and also tell us what what you feel arts and culture and your practice of it has to offer in making the situation better so nigma um could you quickly part the question um please yes. uh, te tell us what you feel art artistic expression the practice of art uh, can do to make the situation better and then give us a performance as we take down the discussion uh thank you very much um i think over the past we have witnessed the rise of different uh, artistic form of expression in terms of uh you know creative industry 
And so far, we have witnessed the like of uh, the famous names like uh, the baby advocating for the injustice and racism that is happening in America. So in terms of artistic expression and um, using art to be able to you know, voice these kind of issues, it, it is really vital, um, really vital. And so far, I have been able. It is also a form of giving your art a purpose. And what is uh, you know, a better way to give your art a purpose than giving the voices the voice? Um, so I think I um, play a really, really vital um, part in you know, eradicating and informing the community um, on the, the things, activities, and the injustice, the vices that do happen in our communities. I will perform a piece called, um, it's called Don't Touch Me There. Um, I got inspired by, um, by this piece of music uh, from this wonderful lady uh, from Jamaica. I will not waste your time, I will start. Daddy, don't touch me there. I'm gonna tell on you one day, I swear. Can't you see I'm scared you're supposed to be my. Mm -hmm. Daddy, don't touch me there. I'm gonna tell on you one day, I swear. Can't you see I'm scared you're supposed to be my... I'm supposed to be your daughter. I'm supposed to be your daughter and you are supposed to be my father, protector, provider, not the one that but slapped me in a corner with a knife and one strong arm in my collar. Mom, mom, I call her. Honor your father and mother so you shall live long, but how do you honor the one that did you wrong like glass? Lies shattered the little angel's heart. Life she curse, cause only pain she knows. Daddy, don't touch me there. I'm gonna tell on you one day, I swear. Can't you see I'm scared you're supposed to be my Ooh. Daddy, don't touch me there. I'm gonna tell on you one day, I, I swear. I don't know what it is. I don't know where the money is. I lost my direction. Is this north, south, or east? It ties me up and raped me multiple times. The only time I feel at ease is when I am asleep. Daddy, don't touch me there. I'm gonna tell on you one day, I swear. Can't you see I'm scared you're supposed to be my... Daddy, don't touch me there. I'm gonna tell on you one day, I swear. Can't you see I'm scared you're supposed to be my, you're supposed to be my protector. Thank you very much. I am Dave. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you so much, Dave. For those who are wondering, you can catch Dave and Jock today at 7 p.m., giving us more of these nice and informative pieces of poetry in line with today's discussion. We'll be coming to you live on our social media pages as in right now. Please join in. The conversation is on the Gaming Grip Experience 3. The hashtag for today is on human trafficking. But we will be having another panel discussion in the evening with one winning table who is who works also for Heart Kenya, which are our partners for today's event, as well as this live feed that you are seeing today. We'll also be having on the panel Joyce, Joyce, who joined us earlier on in the discussion. She will also be giving us nuggets of wisdom in line with her work. And we will be having a very, very interesting, informative, fun packed time you do not want to miss. Remember, it's from 7 p.m. sharp. Right now, I want to give our panelists a, a, a minute or so to give us their final remarks, even as we end the discussion. I will start with Sophie. Sophie, your final remarks. Thank you so much, Omeka, even for just the opportunity to, to be here and, and have this conversation. 
Um, I think for me, I've taken away a, a lot away from of, from this morning's discussion. Um, even learned a lot, uh, and just to be cognizant of what we do in our communities. Um, what I think I'd like to highlight is children, and to consider that when these young individuals are trafficked, when they're exploited. We always need to remember that children grow up. And so what are they growing up to become? What will, what will, the, what will the, the things you're doing to them, how, what kind of impact will it have on their lives? And so who will they grow up to be? We all try and raise our children to become functional members of society. But then if we're exploiting our children, we are um, putting them through forced labor, forcing them to, to, to do crimes of their own, um, recruiting them as child soldiers, taking them through sexual exploitation, who will they grow up to become? So as Mohammed was saying earlier, rather than wait for things to get thick and react, rather than wait for, for people to get unwell, let's learn to take a vaccine approach to things or matters mental health. Rather than wait for people to come in distress, let us learn how to cope better. Let us learn how to ensure our own mental health and wellness. But particularly, let us also just remember the children and that they, we need to consider who, that, who they will grow up to become. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophie. Next, we will have Elizabeth. Uh, I think for me, two points. Number one, uh, we need to be, we need to realize that, I, I had said this before, most of us are one disaster away from economic instability, if not permanently living in economic instability, and therefore trafficking is a potential reality for many of us or family or friends. Um, and we need to be understanding of that rather than judgmental. And we need to be our sister's keeper in, and brother's keeper in that we, I, there was a question that Sophia talked about um, supporting victims when they come back. Like that's one thing we can all do on a personal level. So for me, those are our remarks. Like we look at it and we see what can we do and how can we be better and then now demand better of, I had spoken about this before, demand better of our government. What is it doing to assist us? It has an obligation to support victims. What is it doing to, like, how do our consulates work? How do our embassies work? We need to start asking these questions of our representatives in both county and national governments and holding them accountable. So just those two things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Right now, I'll go over to Dave. Dave, what are your final remarks? Dave, please unmute yourself. My apologies, my apologies. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in, everyone who followed the conversation, and thank you to my fellow um, panelists. I just want to say um, just what Elizabeth said. Everyone is a potential victim of, you know, in slavery or um, human trafficking. Today it might be me or today it might be your neighbor, but being accountable and, you know, being responsible and being your brother's keeper um, should be a priority. Humanity should, should be a priority. So if you're watching, your takeaway should be, you should be human and be watchdog, you know, be the society watchdog. It doesn't matter um, whether you are, I mean, of any class of life, you should be a watchdog of your society. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much, Dave. And last but not least, Mohammed. Closing remarks, Mohammed. 
Okay, closing remarks for me. Three, three, three pointers, uh, Omeka. Uh, one, uh, apart from using human rights-based approach or seeing the issue of trafficking as a human rights concern, let's see it also as an issue of organized crime. One. Two, let's address the legal lapses uh, that are there. And three, let's uh, look into the operational hindsight of addressing issues of human trafficking. Let's test that, see how it plays out, and then reevaluate again. Those would be my closing remarks. Thank you so much, Mohammed. I'd like to now bring this um, live stream to a close by giving a lot of thanks to the people who made it possible. And that is, of course, uh, our friends at Global Initiative under the leadership of Joyce. We also have Heart Kenya. Heart Kenya is awareness against human trafficking for the, for the partnership and for building up the discussion and helping us sort out through a lot of what this discussion should be and actually is today. Don't forget that the discussion continues much, much later during the day, actually, and leading up to the concert we have for you guys in the evening from 7 p.m. You do not want to miss it. It will be an array of poets, musicians, percussionists, storytellers, back to back, with discussions on the topic of today by uh, Winnie from Heart Kenya and as well as Joyce from Global Initiative. From us here at Anika Initiative, the curators of this discussion, and from our panelists in this live feed, we want to say we love you all. But everything that starts has to have an ending, and so we would like to say we love you and we'd like to leave you. I'd ask my panelists to wave at anybody who is watching, <laughs> just because we can. <laughs> Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you.